which has inspired our symposium today, also called Emmanuel, spelled differently, which comes from the Hebrew, God is with us. This name is intended to evoke both the actual church in Charleston, as well as reference the metaphorical idea of church as a place of both spiritual and political redemption, of sanctuary and activism. In a moment, Scott Bishop, the museum's education curator and university liaison, will introduce our speakers for today. But before I turn things over to her, I want to thank her for the phenomenal job she has done in organizing this event, as well as tonight's musical performance that will follow Dr. Twig's presentation, in addition to a, a gospel music program tomorrow morning from 10 to noon. Um, Scott has a tendency to pack it in, and I'm grateful to her for that. Uh, I know that Dr. Johnny Green, Assistant Vice President in Student Affairs, and Dr. David Carter, Associate Professor of History, were also enormously helpful in the planning for all of this, and we want to thank them as well. I also want to thank Ursula Higgins and Ursula Catering for hosting a delicious dinner for our symposium participants last night at her home. And finally, I want to acknowledge that our symposium was made possible in part by a grant from the Alabama Humanities Foundation, which is, of course, part of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and Auburn University Special Lectures Fund. Thank you all for being here today. We're so happy to be able to present this program to you. And now I will turn over the introductions for our symposium to Scott Bishop. Good afternoon. I'm so happy to have you here. Um, and I'm so happy that this day has come. We've been planning for a long time. And <clears throat> it's one of the most um, important things I've ever worked on. Ah, OK. So the way that the logistics will work for this is that um, we will start Dr. Bailey's talk um, with, Dr. with Dr. Bailey's talk. Um, and when he gets done, and he will take questions, and then there will be a little micro break, and then after that, at 2 o'clock, um, Dr. Powers will talk, and there will be a little break after that. During those breaks, you can go into the galleries and, and have a look at the exhibition if you haven't had a chance to do that. And then at 3 p.m., um, Doctors Green and Dr. Doctors Green and Carter will will have a conversation on stage. It will be more of a sort of informal pro, um, presentation of them talking with each other about issues, and then they will invite Dr. Bailey and Dr. Um, Powers back up onto the stage, and they'll that will just feed into a panel discussion. So um, just to let you know what the logistics will be. There's water outside. If you'd like to have a glass of water during, the, the, during one of the breaks, just don't bring anything, um, any water back into the auditorium. So I will begin by introducing Dr. Richard Bailey, who is an Alabama historian and retired research specialist from the Center of Aerospace Doctrine, Research, and Education at Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery. Um, Bailey is a member of several speakers bureaus, including the Alabama Humanities Foundation Bureau. A lecturer and tour guide, he makes frequent appearances on radio and television to discuss Alabama history, Southern history, and contemporary issues. And he also has been a consultant on several documentaries about Alabama culture. He is the author of two books on Alabama history. They too call Alabama home, African American profiles, 1800 to 1999, and neither carpenters nor, nor scallywags, black office holders during the reconstruction of Alabama, 1867 to 78, 1878. I'm very pleased to have him here. He's, he brought um, a visual uh, poster that he sat inside the, um, the door for you to look at during the break, and I will turn the podium over to him. Thank you for being here, Dr. Bailey. On Wednesday night, 
June 17, 2015, a lone 23-year-old white gunman walked into Charleston's Emanuel Temple AME Church and opened fire, killing nine people. The next day, the mayor of Charleston called the attack a hate crime. I want to thank Scott Bishop for that simply wonderful introduction and to uh, Dr. Marilyn Lawford, the director of this museum, and to the people who are standing in front of me, just to let you know, it is indeed a pleasure, privilege, and an opportunity to return to Auburn University, Auburn, Alabama, to speak once again. The hospitality that has been shown to me has just been off the charts. And I just want to let you know that um, as I move around the state, if anybody asks me to name some of the wonderful places where I have spoken, I want to let you know one wonderful city whose name I will be more than happy to invoke. <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> the program today lists my topic as under their own vine and fig tree, African Americans and the church in Southern history. Reference to the vine and fig tree appears three times in biblical scriptures. First Kings 4 and 25 and Zechariah 3 and 10. Yet for our purpose today, I wish to rely on the King James Version of Micah 4 and 4, which states, quote, but they shall all sit under their own vines and fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid, end quote. Our concern today then focuses on the church as a place of refuge. What we call the black church is as old as the American Revolution. In 1788, Peter Bryan established America's first black church in Savannah, Georgia. This church sprang from a black congregation that had been established in 1773. Other black churches claiming to be the first include the First Baptist Church of Petersburg, Virginia, organized in 1774, and the African Baptist or Bluestone Church, which was founded on the William Byrd Plantation in Mecklenburg, Virginia, in 1758. Whatever the case, in Alabama, at least three black churches were established in the early part of the 18th century. Stone Street Baptist Church in Mobile generally gets the credit for being the first black church in Alabama, having been established under a brush arbor in 1806. Two black churches were established in North Alabama. The first, the African Huntsville Church, was established in 1808 under the direction of Reverend William Harris. The second church, the African Baptist Cottonport, was established in the mid-1820s. These Alabama churches, as I said, established in North Alabama, joined the Flint River Association and sent delegates to its meeting in startling contrast to the Cahaba Association, which disallowed black delegates from its mobile branch. The African Huntsville Church became a primitive Baptist congregation and remained active in the association until after the Civil War. African Baptist Cottonport dropped out of the association in 1840. This church wanted to engage in missionary work. Although white Presbyterian missionaries were sent to plantations to work with enslaved Africans, few independent black Presbyterian churches were established in the region. Most of the black uh, churches in the South instead were either Methodist or Baptist. Still black churches in the South face several challenges. In some instances, stern resistance by slaveholders and state legislatures forced some Southern black churches to close at least until after the Civil War. 
These slaveholders and state governments considered black churches part of the Underground Railroad, and some were. Participating churches housed runaways in a four-foot area under the sanctuary. A tribal uh, symbol in the ceiling indicated the church was a station on the Underground Railroad. Slaveholders and state governments also viewed black churches with suspicions because they associated the black church with slave revolts. Some of the evidence pointed to Richmond, Virginia, where on August 30, 1800, literate blacksmith Gabriel Prosser and 25 enslaved uh, followers were scheduled to initiate a large slave uprising. They were later hanged for their efforts. A Methodist Prosser had been inspired by the American and French revolutions. In 1822, Denmark Vesey and 34 co-conspirators were hanged for planning a revolt in Charleston, South Carolina. 67 others were convicted for the June 22nd conspiracy. Earlier members of the local Presbyterian church, Vesey and his followers found their vine and fig tree in the establishment of the AME Church by Richard Allen in Philadelphia in 1816, making the AME Church the first independent black denomination in America. In 1818, Vesey co-founded an AME Church in Charleston, which attracted 1,848 members making it the second largest AME church in all of the United States. Before being banned completely from South Carolina, the church was closed beginning in 1818 for holding services after sunset and again in 1821 for using its classes as a school for slaves. Vesey, an AME preacher, identified with the enslaved population of the city and used the Bible to instill hope for freedom. Also feared was the AME Zion denomination, which was established in New York in 1820 and whose membership included such lay members as Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, and Sir John the Truth. The AME Zion Church became known as the Freedom Church. Yet one of the best known slave revolts occurred in Southampton County, Virginia, where enslaved preacher Nat Turner was found guilty of plotting an insurrection on the 22nd day of April, August, excuse me, 1831. To prevent such an occurrence, however, Southern legislatures passed a series of laws during the first half of the 19th century that restricted the actions of free blacks. For example, in 1832, Alabama made it illegal to teach free blacks and enslaved Africans to read and write. Later in 1844, Southern Methodist congregations separated from the Methodist church over the issue of slavery and formed the Methodist Episcopal Church South. Despite the actions of slaveholders and state legislatures, the enslaved community used passwords to draw others to the invisible church for emotional and spiritual relief. These persons rejected the restrictions in the white church where they were expected to worship under white control. They had no say in church affairs, although black members outnumber white members in some instances. They sat in the rear or in the gallery, and in many instances, they were considered spectators and denied full membership. On the other hand, the invisible church enabled enslaved persons to listen to a black preacher, something they considered a treat, a true delight. The invisible church also provided for a comforting black control environment that was free of, black super, of white supervision. And most of all, 
a place where they can enjoy their own worship style, which reminded them of home and might include it drumming, dancing, mourning, hand clapping, and other aspect of worshiping disallowed in the white church. Black worshipers suffered severe punishment for attending the invisible church. Yet no price was considered costly when enslaved person acknowledged that more than anything else on earth, the invisible church offered them a relief and an opportunity to survive slavery. It became a refuge in a hostile land. The end to the Civil War provided another source of optimism for enslaved persons and free Africans in America who viewed the end of enslavement as delivery of the children of Israel from bondage and the answer to their prayers. When President Abraham Lincoln arrived in Richmond on April 4, 1865, former slaves greeted him wildly and considered him as their Moses. On April 23rd, the voices of former slaves rang out in a packed State Street Baptist Church in Mobile as they sang, free workmen in the cotton field and in the sugar cane, free children on the common school ground with never more a chain. Then rally, black Republicans, a rally, we are free. We waited long to sing the song the song of liberty. Indeed, with the end to legal enslavement, former bondsmen could move about freely, assume last names, live as families, work for wages, acquire an education, seek enfranchisement, occupy public offices, and attend a church of their choice. The independent African-American church became the centerpiece for change in black communities across the post-Civil War South. In fact, it was the only place of refuge for African-Americans in the entire country. The minister became the central figure in the black community. He was an educator, counselor, financial advisor, political leader, and role model. To aid formerly enslaved persons, several denominations sent missionaries into the South, including such predominantly white churches as the Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and Episcopalian. But a majority of African Americans chose the Baptist persuasion and other independent Northern black denominations as the African Methodist or AME, and the African Methodist Episcopal Zion, or AME Zion, churches to establish independent black congregations. Some of them joined the Colored Methodist Episcopal Church, established in 1870 in Jackson, Tennessee, by departing African American members of the Methodist Episcopal Church. This church was renamed the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church in the 1950s. The CME, and AME Zion churches had attracted more than 200,000 converts by 1880. Organized locally from the bottom up, Baptists were not positioned to offer statistics regarding membership, but we can say the first African Baptist church of Richmond, Virginia claimed 4,000 members by 1869. Black allegiance to the Catholic church grew only after the Civil War. Banned from South Carolina in 1822, uh, courtesy of, of the D, of Easy Revolt, the AME Church, under the leadership of Bishop Daniel Payne, grew to 44,000 by 1877 and to 400,000 by 1880, making it the second largest black denomination in all of the United States. Black Episcopalians and black Presbyterians numbered 100,000 by 1900. Indeed, many, if not most, of the independent black churches in America were established in the South between 1865 and 1900. In Alabama, one such church was the Black First Baptist Church in Montgomery, 
which grew out of the white First Baptist Church. In 1865, black members numbering more than 600 were ready to build their own church. The 267 white members of the church wanted them to remain, but later helped them to purchase property for a church after the black members insisted on leaving. Reverend Isaac Taylor Titchener, who had arrived as pastor in 1852 and had served as one of the fighting chaplains for the Confederacy during the Civil War, traveled to the North to raise funds for the construction of a black church and help these members to make a loan to build a church. Tishner relocated to Auburn in 1872 as president of what became Auburn University and later helped to articulate a vision for a new South. Many black schools were funded and founded during the immediate post-bellum period. In helping to transform the South, the AME uh, operated more than 2,000 schools with an enrollment of 155,000. Most of these institutions were located in the South. These AME schools included Allen University in Columbia, South Carolina, Edward Waters College in Jacksonville, Florida, Morris Brown College in Atlanta University, and Paul Quinn College in Dallas, Texas. Later, AME Bishop uh, Henry McNeil Turner worked with the Freedmen's Bureau in Georgia, where he helped to establish AME churches. The mission of the AME church is to minister to the social, spiritual, and spiritual development of all people, including feeding the hungry, clothing the um, naked, housing the homeless, cheering the falling, providing jobs for the jobless, administering to the needs of those in prisons, hospitals, nursing homes, asylums, and mental institutions, and senior citizen homes, caring for the sick, the shut-in, the mentally and uh, socially disabled, encouraging thrift and economic development, and bringing people back into the church. The Congregation of this American Missionary Association was one of the leading proponents of black education in the post-bellum South. It founded the following schools, Berea College in uh, Kentucky and Atlanta University, both in 1865, Fisk University, 1866, Hampton University, 1868, Tougaloo College, 1869, and Dillard University, Talladega College, and Lamont Owens, in um, 1867, and also Avery Normal Institute in Charleston in 1867. An arm of the AMA, the Freedmen's Aid Society, recruited teachers from the North and secured housing for them. My neither carpetbaggers nor scalawag book lists the hometowns of teachers who ventured into Alabama and details where they worked and when. AMA teachers were mostly unwelcome in the South by whites. Alabama historian Walter Linwood Fleming notes that these teachers used such history texts as Freedman's Reader and Freedman's Histories, which were considered especially objectionable because they offered a Northern view of Southern history. AMA teachers were hated, insulted, and refused housing by whites. Male teachers were beaten, killed, are warned to leave. Others disappeared. Schools were burned. The AMA also built churches. As the 19th century ended, the church had elevated black illiteracy from 5% in 1870 to 70% by 1900. Still, the South found ways to stall the progress of African Americans. The Plessy decision of 1896 set the tone for the 20th century. New enfranchised, disenfranchising constitution also played a major role. Alabama became the leader in these disenfranchising constitution with this constitution of 1901 and its added amendments which made that constitution one of the longest constitution in the country. The black church filled the void played by the federal government by reinforcing its role as a conduit of hope. 
Lynchings continued as a way of life for African Americans, even after the United States had fought in World War I to make the world safe for democracy. The period witnessed the 1915 revival of the Ku Klux Klan, courtesy of Methodist minister William J. Simmons, who was said to have been inspired by the movie Birth of a Nation. In New York, the NAACP protested its March 1915 showing. Birth of a Nation was considered one of the most admired and profitable films ever produced in Hollywood. In 1940, it was replaced in popularity by Gone with the Wind, which also glorified the lost cause. With the unneeded support of these films, the Klan attacked African Americans, Jews, Catholic, and foreigners, and saw its membership increase into the millions. The era of the Confederate flag was born. In 1948, South Carolina's Thorm Thurman displayed the battle flag prominently at the Dixiecrats Convention. In 1954, the Brown decision gave new reasons for flying the Confederate flag. 1956, Georgia incorporated the Confederate flag into its new state flag. In 1961, South Carolina placed the Confederate flag over its state house to mark the centennial of the beginning of the Civil War. In 1963, the governor of Alabama did much the same to protest the integration of the University of Alabama. The Klan and other Klan-like groups seemed unstoppable. For example, on Christmas Day, 1956, the group bombed the Birmingham home of Reverend Fred L. Shuttlesworth. On December 10, 1957, they bombed four churches in the home of the Reverend Ralph David Abernathy and white minister Robert Gratz in Montgomery. On December, uh, January 13, 1963, 37-year-old NAACP state director Mega Evers was gunned down in the driveway of his home in Jackson, Mississippi. Later in the year, on September 15, four Klansmen used dynamite to kill four little girls immediately before Sunday morning worship service at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. The decade of the 50s through the 60s in particular became a showdown between the church and status quo that continues to the present. One response to of the church occurred on January 10, 1957, when Martin Luther King Jr., fresh from desegregating city buses in Montgomery, invited 60 ministers to Atlanta to form the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. SCLC sponsored the Birmingham campaign to desegregate uh, downtown stores in April 1963 and the St. Augustine movement in June 1964. These movements led to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. SCLC participated in the August 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. The Selma Montgomery March of March 1965 led to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1965. Despite these gains in the name of civil rights and democracy, Klan-like violence continued. Black churches have been subjected to at least 60 attacks since 1822, with 30 of them coming within an 18-month span in 1995 and 1996, which caused Congress to pass the Church Arson Prevention Act. Red Frederick uh, Shuttlesworth Church was bombed four times. On Christmas Day, 1956, as noted earlier, June 29, 1958, January 16, 1962, and December 14, 1962. Paradoxically, in 1822, the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, was the first black church in America to be burned. 
The church has served as a focal point for black life. Without the black church, there would be no black America. But church attackers failed to yield to the words uttered by Tertullian centuries ago, quote, the blood of Christians is the seed of the church, end quote. Such attackers did not hear ministers emphasize that God is real. Such attackers failed to hear choirs singing, bridge over troubled waters, or how I got over. Attackers failed to discern that when African Americans needed a sanctuary during slavery, the invisible church provided a refuge. That when enslaved persons traveled uncharted trails of the Underground Railroad, the AME Zion Church provided a guiding light. That when African Americans sought the ballot, the Baptist Church helped to diminish feelings of despair. That when the march from Selma to Montgomery needed a rallying place, the Catholic Church answered the clarion call. That when a lone gunman entered Emmanuel Temple AME Church in Charleston and opened fire on unarmed worshipers, the church responded, be not dismayed, wherever be tied. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. Whenever African Americans needed a pillar of faith, the church became a stone of hope. During enslavement and freedom, the church has been a rock in a weary land, shelter in a time of storm. Thank you. I think we're supposed to entertain questions now. Yes. Okay, right. Uh, for first of all, it was um, away from white observance, um, mainly. And I'm glad you asked that question because sometimes uh, those enslaved persons may be carrying on the services uh, with the Invisible Church and a white person may be standing right there and was unaware of it completely because they use codes and passwords. First of all, the password to tell other uh, enslaved persons where the uh, service would be held. But if there were no places to go, they might just hold service in the midst of white standing around and those persons would be completely unaware of what was going on. But the invisible church, first of all and foremost, was a place where enslaved person could go and have services as they were accustomed to having these services, where they could do their dancing and play their drums and clap their hands and, uh, do, what, and do their mornings and whatever else they would want to do. And uh, mainly it was a way of uh, practicing religion as they had practiced back home. That was the invisible church. It was, and sometimes you might find it listed as the secret church. Yes. <laughs> Ma'am, that's one of the, the, the best questions anybody could ever ask because those, those spirituals actually are um, misunderstood when um, those persons saying, go down Moses, they were not talking about Moses. They were talking about somebody on that plantation going down somewhere and telling somebody else what to do. And um, that's how uh, those slaves uh, spoke a double language. Uh, they spoke a language to a white person and they spoke a language to other slaves. And you might say they spoke three languages because any uh, slave person they felt was an ally to the whites, they didn't speak that language to that person. So they spoke a separate language to that person, if you know what I'm saying. Um, because when you look at some of the uh, slave revolts, the whites found out about those revolts from other blacks. And, and that's how some of those revolts did not take place because some black person went and told um, the whites that these blacks were conspiring or planning to hold a revolt. But to, in your question in the main, 
What we call spirituals during the antebellum period were songs, many of them, that had a double meaning. Um, they might uh, be sung in the cotton fields. Uh, they might be uh, sung somewhere around the uh, homes of the plantations. Uh, but they were not uh, being sung as worshiping, if you know what I'm saying, for worshiping purposes. They were being sung to uh, convey a message, a coded message. And the other thing about that that uh, goes with the singing of those songs, um, and this is something that in some black churches uh, a couple of years ago, I don't know about now, uh, you might actually make up the verses uh, that people would sing. You would, somebody would say this, and uh, somebody over here would respond saying something else, because what you're doing, you are noticing your environments, and you are telling people, look out for this, or watch out for that, or be careful about this, or something along that line. And all of those enslaved persons knew exactly what you were talking about. And the, and the other thing is, when I mentioned uh, that uh, tribal symbol in the ceiling of the church, almost nobody caught that. Nobody outside of the runaways uh, in, in the host institution, almost nobody caught that. And that um, four foot area under the sanctuary, you're not gonna move the sanctuary. You, you're not gonna even think about moving the sanctuary. Um, but, but the point is, the Underground Railroad was treacherous still uh, because um, those persons, in most instances, slave knew uh, the terrain only about their immediate area. So when they left that immediate area, they had no idea which way to travel except the North Star. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Okay, um, let, me, let me separate your speech into 19th century and 20th century, if, if I might. The uh, kind of message that uh, black pastors preach in the 19th century was slightly different than the message uh, preached in the 20th century. And in each century, the message was different among black, uh, Baptist churches as opposed to AME and AME Zion churches. Um, in the Baptist churches, uh, the minister was more inclined not to have had an education. In the AME churches, in the AME Zion churches, the minister was more inclined. In fact, the minister did have a college degree, which means then that the message was uh, very different. The songs that were sung in those churches were very different. In the, in the Baptist churches, the song were more inclined to be more emotional, in the AME and AME Zion Church, they are more uh, inclined to be uh, songs that the choir sing, and the congregation might not even participate. But in the Baptist Church, everybody sang a song. Even when the choir sang, the congregation sang also. And the, and the message of the uh, uh, minister um, in the uh, Baptist Church was more, much more animated. And let me tell you how far-reaching your question is. Just about everybody in here, I guess, have heard of the uh, black entertainer James Brown. You know how James Brown works up a frenzy when he's performing, and then he, uh, one of his uh, employees walks on stage and put a cape around his uh, shoulder, and he acts as if he's walking off stage, and he throws off the cape and comes back and continues singing. That's straight out of the black, black church. Those ministers would be preaching. And in those days, every minister could sing. And when he uh, is about to conclude his sermon, he would uh, start singing and the congregation would join him in singing. And then one of the deacons would walk on stage and put his coat around his back. And then he would step down and walk away. And when he get halfway, he would throw the coat off and come back and start preaching again. And the congregation would just be in a frenzy. <laughs> and what I'm saying, uh, the Jackie Wilsons, the Michael Jacksons, the James Brown, they picked up 
that and brought it into showmanship. So, uh, but the, the, the preachers in the, in the um, AME and the AME Zion churches, um, their sermons were much more sedate. Um, the, even, even the service in the AME and the AME Zion churches, the order of service was something that you read. You read a part for the congregation, you read a part for the, the leader. You didn't find that in most Baptist churches. So to answer your question, uh, in the main, in the Baptist churches, the uh, service would be much more animated. And some people, uh, historians who don't really understand the black preacher, they would uh, accuse that black preacher in the Baptist church of being uh, one who engaged in showmanship. But what it is that the black preacher in the Baptist church was supposed to be preaching from the heart. Now, mind you, as I answer your question, this is not black and white in the sense that it does not mean that in some Baptist churches you did not have that, and it does not mean in some AME Zion church and the AME churches you didn't have some of the uh, emotional spirit that you found in some of the Baptist churches. So it's not black and white, but in the main, that is the difference. Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, sir. Okay, all right. What, what he's uh, said, um, he is asking if this comes out of the uh, slave community that you cry when a baby is born and, and uh, that you basically rejoice. Wait a minute. You cry when you're born and rejoice and you die, and he wants to know if that's uh, um, part of the uh, experience in the uh, slave community. I, I've never heard that from the slave community. Uh, I, I did hear that somebody said it was in the Bible that you're supposed to uh, weep when a person is born and, and, and cry because a person is supposed to be born into an evil world or something along that line. I'm, I'm not a theologian, but I don't want to go too far with that. But I, I never heard that it was part of the slave community, to answer your question. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in fact, that, that is commonplace um, uh, in New Orleans. And let me tell you this, when um, blues man Lil Willie John was eulogized in Atlanta in 1856, there were some people who objected to his funeral being held in the church because he sang the blues. We contrast that to New Orleans. And uh, one of his neighbors rose up to say that uh, Lil Willie John was, was a, a good man and that um, he sang the blues to make a living, but he was not an evil person. Question. Yes, yes. Do you have any comments about John Brown's revolt at Harper's Ferry? Such as? <laughs> I mean, I could talk all day about, uh, yeah. It, I can't, I can't tell you this. Um, I've been to Harper's Ferry and I looked over the terrain. Um, J John Brown was supposed to have had visions. He, he uh, um, recruited his sons to fight and he wanted uh, Frederick Douglass to help him and Frederick Douglass refused and told him it was an idiotic idea that wasn't going to um, go anywhere. And um, it, it failed and um, for a bunch of different reasons. But John Brown was committed to uh, rid the country of slavery. And um, the point about John Brown's raid is simply that um, it helped to bring on the Civil War. Many people credit John Brown for doing that. And uh, his name is a household name in Kansas. Um, if you have studied history, in Kansas, and you've never heard of John Brown, you haven't studied history in Kansas. But the point, the point is um, to show you just how little people know history. You can talk about John Brown and what he did, and when you finish talking, somebody's gonna ask you, was he black? 
In other words, it goes against the stereotype that a white person could have been that interested in seeing that slavery came to an end. And one thing that people in Alabama um, have not touched on, when we start talking about the establishment of the Republican Party, the seed for the beginning of the Republican Party began right here in the state of Alabama when James G. Burney left Kentucky and came to um, Huntsville, Madison, in fact, before he moved into Huntsville, and became a member of the original Alabama legislature. He was a two-term mayor of Huntsville in those days. The mayor's term was one term. He left Huntsville because his wife did not want to rear their children in a slave society. But James G. Burney disagreed with William Lloyd Garrison over the issue of slavery. William Lloyd Garrison believed in moral suasion. James G. Burney, who had defended slaves in an Alabama court because he was a lawyer, James G. Burney said, I disagree with William Lloyd Garrison, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to put that slave issue, that abolition issue, on the ballot. James G. Burney helped to establish the Liberty Party. And this is the first time we had a political party in all of America that sought the abolition of slavery. 1854, um, some members of the Know Nothing Party, the Liberty Party, some Northern Democrats met in Wisconsin to establish the Republican Party. One of Alabama's own helped to establish the Republican Party. And when I take that point a step further, Three of the biggest names in all of American history came out of the state of Kentucky during that same time period. Henry Clay, Kentucky. Abraham Lincoln, Kentucky. James G. Burney, Kentucky. And each one had a different approach that led us into war. Question, I love questions. I do, seriously. Because we have, we have so much history out there that uh, has gone Unexplored. You can go all over the state of Alabama and mention the names James G. Burney, and almost nobody knows who you're talking about. And this is the person who gave us the, the Civil War in the Republican Party, right here in Alabama. And see, the point is, Alabama was one of the leaders in the secession movement, not knowing one of our sons at one point had been responsible for bringing on that war by starting the Republican Party. What became the Republican Party? Burney was dead by the time Lincoln was elected. I want to add that. Question, please. Okay. <laughs> 